What do you make of this story about women? And it's not just women, the United States national team now. Even here in Nigeria, there was a time Desire Paranoze came out to say that they also deserve to earn equal pay along with the men. Oshola, as it's at Oshola, the captain of the team, as at that point came out to say that, no, you can't be talking about this. Let us focus on women's football first to make things better with women's football before we can start talking about equal pay. But what do you make of the story? I completely echo the sentiment of um, the protagonists of mm. this struggle, uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, even in Nigeria, um, there's a constitutionally guaranteed right against mm. discrimination. So if the matter were to come up before the National Industrial Court, I would imagine the National Industrial Court would um, look at, um, at it from the viewpoint of an unfair level practice. Mm. Because really, when you are discriminating wage-wise between male and female, what you are invariably doing is you are discriminating between the two sexes. Yeah. So I would imagine that the uh, National Industrial Court, which is actually the court of the jurisdiction to handle such issues, uh, we'll be able to look at it from that angle and make appropriate orders. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to the U.S. Um, I must confess I was a bit alarmed when I saw that judgment because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't privy to the full papers. Mm -hmm. But when I read the summary of the judgment and um, what the judge said, apparently what had happened was that the uh, U.S. female national team went to court seeking to be paid uh, on, on a par with mm -hmm. the men, men's national team. Now, there was a collective bargaining agreement entered into between U.S. national team and U.S. soccer federation. Mm -hmm. That collective bargaining agreement um, more or less prioritized guaranteed pay structure. In other words, what you have is you have a 20-member uh, team every year mm. from the U.S. Women national team who are given a basic salary of $100,000. Now, um, they're also given allowances, traveling allowances and other emoluments. The male, on the other hand, were paid based on pay per play structure, mm -hmm. which simply means that they only, they only get paid when there's a national assignment to execute. So I wouldn't really understand the background behind this struggle because the, the judge found as a matter of fact that, mm -hmm. first of all, there was no proof of discrimination of any sort. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, even if there was evidence of discrimination, that the female national team had been offered the same pay, pay play structure by the U.S. Soccer Federation, Federation, which they rejected. So in Nigeria, under our laws, yeah, and even under the common law, that would be what you call approbating and reprobating. In mm -hmm. other words, you are, you are denying one thing, and then you are coming back to say, to oh, say give me the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the court also found as a fact that, based on um, a, a look at the individual pay of both the teams, the national um, female soccer team had been paid both cumulatively and individually more than the male. Mm. So the only sticking point was the issue about the traveling allowances and the, and the bonuses mm. paid to the men. That is what the court now has um, subjected to full hearing. That okay. hearing will take place in June. But coming back to Nigeria, I, I would want to see the Nigeria female national team put up a little fight. Mm. I, I was a little bit uh, upset the last time they won the, female, the National's Cup in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, they, they were even evicted from their hotel rooms. They couldn't pay for their hotel mm -hmm. allowances. They couldn't pay the agreed bonuses and everything. So, mm. And the then sports minister was embarrassingly quoted in the media saying that nobody expected them to win. <laughs> First of all, there was a deliberate attempt to frustrate their preparation uh, they didn't have all the necessary facilities. There was no traveling allowance. The girls came to camp, obediently trained, practiced, mm. and prepared for these matches. The tournament, eventually mm -hmm. they won. You are saying nobody expected, expected them, them to, to win. win. So it was very embarrassing. I would expect that they would put up some fights. And again, the discrimination in terms of facilities, we, they don't get the same attention, mm. both media coverage and visibility, that the male national team has ob obtained mm. you know, over time. So you now, you now look at it, and then it will be very, very unfair to expect them. And you look at the trophy hall of the, the female national, national team, team and yeah. you see the wide gap. We have won the, the Nations Cup, Niger the Super Eagles has won the Nations Cup only three mm. times. Mm. So I, I want them to uh, put up some fights and maybe uh, get some reprieve mm. against this injustice. All right, we have Ibidonia, you know, Associate in the Sports and Entertainment Law Department, Petchton and Grace, joining us this morning via Skype. Good to have you with us, doing. Hi, Ibidonia, good morning. Yeah, it was your birthday. I was wish you a happy birthday. 
Okay, thank you very much. And it was your birthday yesterday, so a belated happy birthday to you as well. Thank you. It was two days ago. Oh, two days ago. Okay, good. A belated happy yes. birthday um, celebrations to you. Thank you. Now, what's your take on equal pay? Do you think this should be put into consideration for men and women to earn equal pay? Um, okay, thank you for the question. I also echo you know, the voice of my senior colleague, Mrs. Steve. Good morning. Good morning, doing. How are you? I'm fine. So I also echo his sentiment on this um, particular issue. And I don't want, I mean, I might be a little bit sentimental about it, but let me just, let me just hear my thoughts. So, um, like he said, uh, the agitation was about their, their payment structure, the pay per pay stating that the men's national team were paid a little bit more than the women's national team. And the reason, why the, um, the reason why the claims were struck out was because the, it, was, it, was, it was noted that they negotiated different agreements or different payment structures. So the men's national team are being paid again, while the female national team you know, negotiated the salary structure. But while I was going through their claims, because I read their the claims that were filed. Um, the, the plaintiffs actually noted that they tried to negotiate the same salary structure as the new national team sometime in 2017, which was turned down by the U.S. Soccer Federation. So I'm sure this is one of the reasons why the, um, the, the women national team, this is, I'm sure this is one of the reasons why they are really agitated, because they tried to uh, negotiate the same structure. And for that to be the reason why their matter is, is, is thrown out, is a little bit unfair because they tried to negotiate their structure. Now, apart from that, they didn't only claim for monetary earnings. They also claimed for a bit of discrimination on other, on, on other things. Now, the U.S. Soccer Federation, they have the duty of, um, you know, picking out the means of transportation for them, also accommodation and the likes, uh, training grounds, uh, staffing, and, and the rest of that. Now, compared to what the men, uh, compared to what the men enjoy, the, 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 for now, between 2014 and 2017, apparently the male national team, they enjoyed chartered um, air flights, chartered airplanes for about 13 times, of which the women national team did not enjoy anything like that between 2014 and 2017. They had to fly commercial. So these are, the, these are, also, these are the other things that, are, that they are pointing out as being discriminatory. Now, apart from that, the women national team most times have to play on tops of which we know what tops do. They, 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 could, they could bring about long-lasting uh, you know, injuries. Mm. But the women national team have to play on top. But standard stadiums are provided for the men national team for their trainings and the rest of that. Apart from that, there also have issues of staffing, of accommodation, of which the, you know, the, the accommodation is not suitable for the ladies as compared to what the men enjoy. I like the point she's, uh, she's bringing on the table. I like the angle she's taking it from. But I would like to go to, like you mentioned earlier, the trophy cabinet. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Super Falcons of Nigeria, look at the trophy cabinet, it feels like they have more of the African Women Cup of Nations. They've won it more times than the, the male national team. And uh, I mean, the male, the, the, their male counterparts. The same thing applies to the United States national team, the women national team. They've won more titles, trophies than the USA male team. So why would they want to pay that? And I also learned from, from a bit of research, the, the women earn less. They, they earn what the male, in, in six months, the women earn up to what the male team gets to win, uh, to earn in a month. So I'm wondering, why do we still have to go back and have this issue of equal pay? But because for me, I feel like the women are actually doing more and they're doing way better than what the men actually bring into the table. Okay. Um, the equal pay struggle is a, is a start in the struggle to completely emancipate women, women football. Mm. Now, I'll take you back mem down memory lane. Um, there has been this institutionalized discrimination against female football. In 1920, for example, England, nobody knew this. I was I, I, I'm even amazed when I read it. Mm. Uh, there was a, a boxing match, um, boxing day um, match between Brian Kerr ladies mm. and St. Helens ladies on the Boxing Day of 1920. Then they had about 150 female teams mm -hmm. in England alone. Now, um, that match reportedly had an attendance of over 53,000. Now, another, another 14,000 people, spectators, were outside the stadium mm. who couldn't come in, obviously, because that's uh, present-day Goodison Park in Everton. 
So they couldn't gain entry into the stadium, and they were just cheering from outside. So because of the crowd, the unprecedented crowd pulled by that match, for some reason, the English FA pulled the plug on female football mm. the next year, 1921. Then from that 1921, there was no activity. Wow. I challenge you to go and check the records. <laughs> if you see anyone, just let me know. Mm. There was no activity whatsoever in terms of female football worldwide. In the 70s, uh, they started allowing them to train. So, but they were just more or less feeding off the scraps that fell off the table from mm. the men's uh, football. Okay. So it became a problem. Up until now, let me put it in perspective. The first male World Cup started in 1930 in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. The female World Cup, the first male World Cup started in 1991. Now, from uh, an institutionalized discrimination between 1920 to, 19, to the 70s, we now had some kind of um, a toleration, a period of toleration. So mm. the male counterparts were just merely tolerating female football. football. They were just allowing them, but no one was encouraging them. There was no investment whatsoever. Mm. So the argument had been on the commercialization aspect, that female football is not sufficiently commercialized to mm. be paid the same amount of money as their male counterparts. Mm. Okay. But so have you invested mm. anything? But where, would, where do you think this will end up? I think you will get to the point where everyone would um, appreciate the fact that there has been institutionalized and structural discrimination against female football, mm. uh, especially with the recent success. You know, uh, many people didn't even know that there was extensive uh, female uh, media coverage of the last female World Cup. World Cup, yeah. Last, just last year, they had over 24 million views, mm. viewers across the globe. So that is something that. Um, I believe everybody mm. will join the bandwagon and see the need to invest more in female football and treat them equally with the men. I mean, I, I look at Nigeria. I always use Nigeria as an example. It's an aberration. Mm. A team has won over seven times, seven titles in the continent, and they, played, they consistently played in the World Cup. Our main, main national team has won only three titles, three Nations Cup titles. Mm. So what, on what premise, really, are you discriminate on what premise are you paying the men more more than the women so I, I believe with equal investment equal attention equal visibility equal coverage i'm sure the the female football uh uh, uh enthusiasts will definitely see the need to to bridge this gap yes yeah.